So my name's Mark Fletcher, I'm a school teacher by trade, and I thought I'd talk to you about a course that I did five years ago. Um, I'm a middle, I have a middle management position, and five years ago I was sent on the course with several dozen other middle managers, uh, which was very interesting. Hopefully we got the chapter three of the manual. Um, the course was, I think it actually out something somewhere. The course was, uh, sorry, the course was run by a chap called Bruce Holland, who claims to be a management wizard. His, his function is basically to make managers more efficient. And so we did this course for several weeks, and it was sort of the one day a week on it, and we had this big manual to work through. And it was all fine until I got to about chapter three. And chapter three of the manual uh, is where I began to get a bit worried. Um, I like to think that I've got a bit of a, a sceptical bleeper built into my brain. You know, I don't think it's perfect, but sometimes I get it wrong. But I just like to think that my bleeper starts bleeping or starts screaming uh, when I get bullshit thrown at me. And in chapter three of this manual, I got exactly that bullshit. Um, we were told about a great Japanese scientist. His name was Emoto. You ever heard of Emoto? Yes. Right. Well, apparently Emoto has done some very, very, uh, some very fantastic, so I could say, scientific ex experiments. And he's found that humans can influence ice crystals. That if you, if you have a sort of a container of water, and you say angry things to the water, and then you put it in the fridge, uh, you will get very, very beautiful crystal, ice crystals in the morning. But if you say angry things to the ice crystals, uh, the following morning you'll get very ugly ice crystals. <laughs> and this was told, you know, this was told to us, fair dinkum, by this idiot of a uh, trainer we had, that this is fair go, that humans can influence all sorts of things with their brain, including ice crystals. He also told us, by the way, that we're all 98% water, and because we're 98% water, we can influence ice crystals. Now that straight away worried me, because we're not actually 98% water. You don't know how, how much water we are on average? It's actually not less than it. it's about 60 to 70 of them. So anyway, um, I, my sceptical bleeper started bleeping when I heard about Emoto. Uh, and then we told about another great scientist called Baxter. And I don't know if you heard of Baxter, but he's another fantastic American scientist apparently who's done work with plants. And apparently we can influence plants. Well, plants have got, have got emotions. Uh, they're telepathic, etc. And before you pluck your tomato off the vine, it screams for mercy, apparently. Uh, before you cut a lettuce out of the garden, it screams for mercy. They can feel it. If you say angry things to your plants, they get very upset. If you say uh, uh, pleasant things to your plants, then uh, they're much more relaxed. Their blood pressure goes down and so on. Uh, and we were told about this great scientist. And what worried me, I suppose, enormously is how many of my colleagues, my, my colleagues seem to accept this. Well, I went away straight away and, and um, did some Googling. <coughs> did some Googling and, and very quickly found out that Emoto is a fruitcake. Uh, he hasn't, his, his results have not stood up good to peer review. He's in rubbish to peer review. Uh, they haven't managed to duplicate his results. His, his testing is very unrigorous, very unrobust. Um, how the hell do you judge a, what, is, what is a beautiful ice crystal? You don't know, what, how would you judge a beautiful ice crystal? You don't know? You'd blind uh, get the results, uh, you'd rank the ice crystals by order of beauty, and then only then reveal which ones have had positive or negative associations. Ah, oh, right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's if you were doing it properly. How, how on earth would you do that objectively is, is beyond me, but apparently, you see, Emoto, doesn't, he did all the tests himself. <coughs> he, did, he made his own judgments on what is a beautiful ice crystal and what is an ugly ice crystal. There's no blinding at all, no double blind tests at all. Uh, and he's published enormous delight. And of course, he's people, some, some of the gurus, uh, some of the the, uh, the alternative type people think he's fantastic. But uh, Emoto, of course, has been rubbished uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and it worried the hell out of me that, that my course um, this guy has been promoted as a, as a genius. And by the way, my course was, I, mean, I worked for the government, my course cost close to $100,000 of taxpayers' money. And we're getting this sort of bullshit. It seemed to me that um, if, a, if, you, if someone's contracted to supply a course to managers, 
uh, they should give you theory which is well tested, well supported with data. He was giving us bullshit. Same and, course uh, costs 200000 in the private sector. You've heard of it. <laughs> you've, heard of, you've heard of Bruce Holland. Right. Um, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. For how many people? Sorry? But not per person, right? Two men. 100,000 total. For how many people? Oh, probably about three dozen. Um, Baxter, of course, um, well, he also has been rubbish in the peer review. Um, he's used polygraph tests apparently to prove that plants have emotions. Um, but uh, once again, um, he, you know, very under a bust, no double blind testing, etc. etc. So, to cut a long story, I'll finish off. Cut a long story short, uh, I pulled out of that course. Um, I was worried that I'd get in big trouble with my manager for pulling out of this course if it cost so much money. I had a bit of an email debate with, uh, with Bruce Holland, the guy that ran the course, so I told him that he's talking crap. I pointed out why. And of course, he came back with a standard argument with all alternative medicine, all alternative people use. Whenever you challenge their beliefs, what do they say to you? You're being narrow minded. <laughs> the way is you're being narrow minded. You know, you're, you're being. Um, you're being you have got an open mind. You have an open mind. Um, that's the classic sort of response you always get. But anyway, I, I, I rubbished him in the email. I told him I told him why. He was actually writing the chapters of his manual as he went. He hadn't sort of finished the manual, and I did notice that later on, I suppose that's some influence, because later on in the manual he actually modified some of his statements. Uh, he did actually admit he he both and Bax came up later on his manual and he admitted that that, that, that that their their ideas were a bit tentative. He made the point. He didn't, he didn't say that later on. He changed his tune. Uh, I, I rubbished it. I also tried to influence my colleagues. Uh, I, I sort of emailed them all and told them this guy was talking crap. Um, I told my manager and so on. But their basic argument was that um, because this course, sort of three quarters of it was valuable, three quarters of it was worthwhile, it was worth continuing with. So. I wasn't very influential, most of my fellow managers continued with the course, but I made a stand, I boycotted the rest of it. That's my story. Thanks very much. Thank you. Does anybody want to ask anything about that? Um, yeah. What were you meant to learn from the moment? What was, what was the reason? Oh, yeah, um, apparently that We've got to be a peer, apparently we can influence people in all sorts of ways. You can influence them what you say to them and what you want to but you can also influence some of your emotions. Just like we can influence ice crystals and plants with their emotions, we can also influence people with their emotions. Which actually is probably true, you can. Um, but there's, there's pointing out there's all sorts of influences that work there that we're not aware of. I think that's the basic point. Yeah. Sorry, Vicky. Did you have any comment at work about not actually attending? I've had emails over the years, probably about one or two a year, from people who are forced to attend these kinds of things and who feel they can't speak out because they're worried about they're going to get down, downgraded or get no promotion, get no raise or won't get the necessary tick for having been educated properly. Fortunately, my immediate manager supported me. He didn't. He went continue with the course himself, but he accepted that I wouldn't go. Our, our, my immediate manager actually is slightly skeptical himself. Um, he's a great fan of Richard Dawkins. Um, so he sort of accepted it, he didn't mind if I didn't go anymore, but unfortunately he continued himself. But our CEO, who actually was the guy behind the whole course, um, he, he, did, he, he continued and, and it annoys me that, you know, our school uh, isn't, but it hasn't got masses of money and he spent nearly $100,000, I said, of, our, of, of the school money, the school budget on a stupid course. Which, I mean, I, you know, I've spoken to other managers who did the course, and this is five years ago, in recent years, and I asked them, did it really make a difference? No. It was an absolute bloody waste of money. Anyway. Thanks. Oh. in the way people remember tests. Greg, do you want to come up? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, am I loud enough? Okay, good. Uh, so my name is Greg Franco, and I'm a PhD student at Victoria University of Wellington, and I study psychology, and most of what I study is memory and uh, false memories and biases in the way we remember things. 
So if you'd allow me to, I'd like to talk a little bit about my research um, at the university there. So I think it's a safe bet to assume that most of the people in this room have taken a test at some point in their lives, some kind of test. <laughs> is there anyone for whom that is not true? So far, so good. Uh, uh, there's been decades of research, uh, especially lately, that has been revealing that taking a test is not just a way to uh, demonstrate how much you've learned, but actually the act of taking a test can change your memory. And the, the kind of line of research that I find most interesting in my uh, work with my supervisor revolves around is the idea that the arrangement of items on that test can actually affect the way uh, you estimate your performance on that test and actually predict your performance on future tests. So specifically, if you arrange the items on a test in order by difficulty from the easiest to the most difficult, people tend to be overly optimistic about their performance compared to a group that gets randomly ordered questions or questions that begin difficult and then uh, go down to the easiest questions. And probably one of the more interesting parts about this effect is that it actually doesn't affect people's objective performance. It's just their uh, kind of memory or their evaluation of how what they think they did. And so I thought that this effect was really, really interesting, but maybe of limited use to a normal everyday student. So I'm actually looking at whether the order of items on a previous test can affect your predictions about performance on a future test. So the way we tried to answer that question was to give people uh, a cube recall test, like general knowledge, kind of trivial pursuit kind of questions. And we gave people uh, questions that range from really, really easy ones, like what, what is the name of a horse-like animal with black and white stripes? Obviously, that's a zebra. All the way through to really, really, really difficult questions, like uh, maybe it's not quite so hard for Americans, but for New Zealanders, they found uh, the question, what is the last name of the Union general in the Battle of Gettysburg who defeated the Confederate general? <laughs> that was Meade. Uh, so it had these questions that ranged from really, really easy ones to really, really difficult ones. And we gave them to each of our subjects in one of two orders, either from hard to easy or from easy to hard. And then directly after that test, we asked our subjects to estimate, uh, sorry, to predict their performance on a test that we were going to give them in either three minutes or three years into the future. So we wanted to test not just really, really uh, kind of near future, but also predictions about performance in the distant future as well. And what we found was number one, again, uh, we replicated previous research by showing that the order of items didn't actually affect people's objective performance on these tests. But interestingly, even for predictions about future performance, people who took a previous test with easy questions first were more optimistic about their performance on a future test than people who start with hard questions. And that held true for both uh, near future and distant future judgments. And the difference was about seven questions, give or take one or two questions or so. Uh, and that's actually really interesting because it has implications for people's uh, behavior as far as studying goes for future tests. You can imagine that someone who is overly optimistic about their performance on a future test might not study quite as much uh, compared to someone who is pessimistic. So that's actually one avenue of research we're looking on later on. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions about uh, mechanism or uh, our future research as far as behavioral results. Thanks. Um, how big a difference was there in the sort of optimism bias between the short-run and long-run groups? Uh, the, the question was how big is the difference between uh, people who are estimating performance in three, about three minutes or so versus three years? And the bias was the same between both of them, and it was seven, about seven questions, give or take a question or so. Um, both. Uh, one interesting thing is that people's predictions about performance in three years were overall more optimistic, so there was a main effect for how far into the distant future people were predicting. Mm -hmm. Yes? Did you actually test them again in three minutes or a week or something and see whether their performance differed? No, we haven't, but uh, that's one thing we're looking to do in the future is take 
materials that are a little bit more educational so they could study in between and we'll give them a study uh, a period of studies to see if actually people really do do better if they um, got hard questions first for example because they might study harder yeah but we haven't tested them in three minutes uh, how many people were involved in this research? Uh, we've done many, many replications. So there's at least seven replications of the past condition, and we've had three replications of the future condition. And overall, I'd say there's been over 1,500 people in this study. Do you do any psychometric type testing to see generally for optimism before the testing? Generic levels of confidence within themselves? I've had someone else uh, in my lab do similar research with eyewitness tests. And uh, generally, people for the eyewitness tests tend to be uh, a little bit pessimistic before they go in. But uh, I haven't actually run a condition yet where people predict their performance beforehand. But we suspect that um, being hit by easy questions, really, really easy questions, or really, really difficult questions is somehow violating people's expectations about how well they're going to perform on a trivia test. Because some people might, or I think, I would think most people would expect to get a few right and a few wrong. But if you get five in a row that you're doing super well, or five in a row that you're doing super poorly, that might be what kind of sets people's um, impression about, wow, this is really, really easy. And we think that's what's probably creating the bias. Does that make sense? Is there any, um, what age group were you studying and was there, is there any studies of a wider age group? Like five-year-olds, ten-year-olds, twenty-year-olds, fifty-year-olds? So the question was about which age group has been in this study and we haven't tested children yet, uh, but these studies have been run on university age students as well as uh, so our, our online populations run between 18 years old to 73 years old. And the average is about 32 years old. Uh, so, but we haven't tested children yet. Um, oh, um, you said um, that uh, your, the, you, the results would imply that the people would study harder if they were had harder results. But could it not possibly work the other way that they um, might be more motivated because they felt they did well? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you can kind of predict both directions. So let's say, for example, someone is quite pessimistic about their future performance and might make someone want to study harder. Or we may have completely crushed their hopes and dreams, you know, by, by making someone think they've done quite poorly. Uh, and a person might not care so much about the future test. So you're absolutely right. We could predict really either direction. Um, and that's one thing we're hoping to find out. Yeah. In the back. Sounds like a very interesting line of research. Can you explain to me how, from a methodological standpoint, <laughs> how you think you can measure how people modify their behavior as a result of their perceptions of how well they think they did in the test? Uh, modify their behavior as far as studying goes? Well, yeah, because you mentioned before that part of it is if they think they did well, mm. then they're less likely to study. If they think they did poorly, then they may be more likely to study. Have you thought about, from a method standpoint, how you would be able to evaluate that? Yeah, I've actually been thinking quite hard about a study to evaluate that. Um, we found a similar pattern of results, not just with trivia questions, but with uh, vocabulary words as well, so um, foreign vocabulary words. So we teach our subjects some Swahili words in the beginning of the study, and then give them a test on those Swahili words that's arranged in one of two orders. So we could actually give them uh, a study period afterwards of those same Swahili words. Um, and we can evaluate you know, how much time they spend on each type of word, whether it's difficult or, or easy, overall study time, and also evaluate their, their final performance. So there's actually many measures we can take uh, that could to help us answer that question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. One more. Uh, yeah, uh, it's in my interest to sort of crossword puzzles. Mm -hmm. You'd recommend that the ones at the top left be easier to encourage more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on what you want out of the crossword puzzle. <laughs> I, just want to, I just want people to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> well, since it actually doesn't affect people's actual performance on the tests, I don't know. I, it's, I, I hesitate to make any recommendations based on the research because it's kind of young. But if you want people to be uh, optimistic based on their performance, you would start with easy questions, definitely.
<laughs> but then again, after you get your results, you'd be unpleasantly surprised. So maybe you want to be pessimistic, and then you could be pleasantly surprised once you get your results. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Great. Thank you. John Hutchinson, uh, climate denialism. It's kind of important since uh, our survival and certainly the survival of coming generations depends on it. Um, let's see, the Koch brothers uh, in the US have um, known for many things. Uh, they run the Coke, an organization called Coke Industries. It's the second most profitable uh, company in the US. And they spend a bunch of money. Uh, Speak up. Yep, and they spend a bunch of money uh, to get skeptics to deny the climate science. Now, to their credit, the skeptics came back and said, well, actually, the scientists are on them, <coughs> uh, for the most part. Um, it said they were still trying to buy newspapers to speak climate denial from this. Um, now, the, the Koch brothers would be. It would be fairly um, a bit of a no-brainer to say that they have uh, self-serving bias. Uh, Paul Brown comes from a different angle. Um, and he describes climate change as the biggest hoax perpetrated by scientists ever, um, which is interesting considering the evidence before. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Which is interesting. Yeah, which is considering considering which is interesting considering the evidence before the public. Um, there's Sandy and the big mess it made in New York. There's the failure of crops in the American bread basket. And uh, even here in Wellington, we've just had the warmest winter we've ever had since records began. And we also had a 100-year-old seawall get demolished um, by that big storm a few months back. Paul Brown is also known for saying Oh, hang on. He's also on the House Committee for Science, Space and Technology, and last year before the election said that uh, evolution, embryology, and the Big Bang Theory were lies from the pit of hell designed to make people like him believe they don't need a personal savior. Um, the, um, the, the, the religious angle there is actually uh, quite important as well. Um, this might be information privacy involved involved in this one. And um, they also, often you also can also hear that the media are affecting climate change, but things seems to be getting, the evidence is showing that things are worse than we predicted in 1990. They're right and done. <laughs>
apologise for going, oh, hello! Um, my name is Susie, and um, I'm actually not going to talk to you for five minutes, um, because my question was more a um, want to start some discussion. Um, and it's prompted by having um, a small child, and uh, we like singing Christmas carols. And I made the mistake, because I'm not a New Zealander, of taking, oh, and I also like things that go in the dark. It's kind of really important to the story. Um, and so I took her to the Vector Arena to do the Carol Pie glow stick. And oh my god! Sorry. Um, that place is scary, so it's kind of evangelical and stuff. And, uh, and Evie, in fact, asked to leave because she um, is aware of religion being shoved down her throat. Um, and, and so I kind of thought, wouldn't it be fab if we had somewhere we could go to sing um, skeptical Christmas carols and wave our glow sticks? And so this sort of prompted a thought about what a skeptical church would look like, really. Um, and uh, what, who would, would people go? And um, wanting a kind of family-friendly space like the Skeptics in the Pub. Um, so, yeah, discuss. Please. Would Skeptics even have a church? Church, right? Church. Yes. Did they actually meet? Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. So, that, so the idea is, what kind of space would you like, right? What kind of family? Would you be interested in a family-friendly space? And if so, what would you like that space to look like? Lots of stained glass. Coming. Do the people down the back keep it down? Your voices are interfering with our really shitty PA system. <laughs> Please, thank you. Hey, there's something called the Sunday Assembly, which started in the UK and is currently spreading worldwide. They had their most recent um, event over in Melbourne. <laughs> There's a group who call themselves the Sunday Assembly and they have started in the UK, have started moving over to the US, have had sessions in Melbourne and essentially they consider themselves to be a church without a church. They have uh, songs which praise science, they have science lectures, they have the opportunity for people to uh, talk about science and essentially have gatherings together on a Sunday in order to build up a community and yet it's not church. They call themselves the Sunday Assembly. Um, Am I allowed to plug my podcast? <laughs> uh, if you check out the Token Skeptic podcast, tokenskeptic.org, you'll find a link to um, an interview where I transcribe um, a discussion with one of the people who created the Sunday Assembly. And that might be something worth looking into because they are trying to seed worldwide. It doesn't necessarily have to be one of the originators who created the Sunday Assembly who starts a Sunday Assembly, but it might be well worth looking into. I know it's more sort of atheist, but I'd be interested in seeing what maybe a more skeptic y side could bring to it. So the notion of a skeptic church I think is an excellent one. At least skeptical gatherings of that kind. Especially for the younger people, I mean yeah. Yeah. Do you want the mic? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. 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 Okay, I can do that. Um, there has been a group established in New Zealand actually called the Sea of Faith, which are not believers and they have little faith. You could actually look at them as being very skeptical people. There's an awful lot of highly educated and ex-priest type people in there. There is no formal church, and they do run annual conferences and have newsletters. And it's, it's quite an interesting place, and it's not ramming anything down anyone's throat. And they are interested in that dimension. They also ask the skeptics to speak at the conferences. <laughs> Who, who would go to something like that? Would anybody go? As long as it's after 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Will we be beer? <laughs> yes! Go <laughs> Anybody else want to say something they'd like? Is the body of science made out of beer? <laughs> There's an op six of the set working. Can it's terrible. Mind? Just yell at it. There is an organisation in the States which calls themselves 
the Church of Beethoven. I think you can Google them. And in effect, they just get a number of clever people who are uh, highly secular, and they have chats and discuss things, but they wrap it around some piece of Beethoven music. I mean, it can't be anything in principle, but they use that as a central interest to gather, but they are simply not religious. Uh, you could also redefine Christmas. Uh, back home, I'm from South America. Uh, the 12th of October, for many, for centuries, it was considered the day Colomb, Christopher Columbus arrived, and we were discovered. And for m centuries, yeah, we were discovered and praised the, the Spaniards and praised the over 90% of the population that got washed up because of disease and slavery and so on. And after 500 years of raising them, uh, many countries decided to change the name of the national holiday, 12th of October, instead of Day of the Discovery, it became the Day of uh, Ethnicity, the day of celebrating the multiple ethnicities of Latin America. And from being a day that you are forced to celebrate as a holiday because of all the negative things that have happened in the past, it became a day to embrace what you are. And I know that if I ever have a child and have to talk to them about Christmas, I'll say, well, once upon a time, there was a child that was born. He was persecuted. Parents, well, if he existed. Uh, he was persecuted. Parents managed to keep that child safe. And when he grew up, he was a wise man. There's no theological idea behind it. It's just like every child is potentially a good person. And that is what you celebrate at Christmas. And that's why we give them presents. At least from my perspective, you could really find Christmas, given a story like that, like just taking the good side and see the potential of what it could carry for society rather than the theological. Yeah. Is that my name? Anyone else? Yeah. Does it have to be called a church? Yeah. You can call it what you like. I just said church because that's kind yeah, of a gap. Then you get people saying, "Oh, look, they really want to be like us." Well, so that's the other question. Like, should it happen on a Sunday, right? It's, it's like right. vegetarians and tofu sausages. Yeah. I mean, if you look at vegetarian <laughs> tofu, don't eat tofu sausages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, um, I asked this question at something else, and uh, there was a lady there who um, started a um, community garden, and she says, like, what you're what you're talking about sounds like a community garden, frankly. So they had this garden that they started, and that was the thing that brought everybody together. Um, so it sounded like you needed something to bring everyone together, and then they had this thing, so it was a thing rather than a place, um, and they, you know, used that as their, and they were now building a little building next to it that they could, you know, have coffee, and people came to tend the garden and brought cakes and stuff, and, and I kind of like the idea, except I don't like gardening, so I don't like it's soil in the nails. Anyway, thank you very much. And how clear am I now? Right, so we need to talk straight into it. <laughs> Mark Hanna. Mark Hanna, how to read medical advertisements. Hello, um, I'm Mark Hanna. I've, okay, sorry, start. About a year ago, I saw an infomercial on TV, and it was this guy calling himself, I think it was Dr. Ho, and he was selling something I'd read about recently as not being entirely legitimate, so I looked him up and found he's not a medical doctor, so I thought, okay, this is a bit dodgy, and I sent an email to the Advertising Standards Authority just asking, is this okay, can you do this? And then I got an email back saying I made a complaint. Um, so that was a good surprise. It turned out they didn't change the ad, and I sort of thought, okay, I can make a difference here, and since then I've kept doing it. Every time I see bullshit, pretty much I've been complaining about it, and it's been quite successful. And as part of that, I've looked into how the Advertising Standards Authority does things, and a lot of medical advertisements are written in such a way that when you read it as a consumer, it sounds like they're definitely making a therapeutic claim, but when it goes to regulators, they get away with it. Um, Stuff. 
Yes. Okay, so there's the Association of New Zealand Advertisers that big advertising groups belong to, and they have a system that they call TAPS, which is the Therapeutic Advertising pre betting System. And whenever the ASA upholds a complaint about a therapeutic ad, they say, go talk to TAPS, they'll sort you out, they'll tell you what you can and can't say. And I thought that sounded pretty good until I looked into them and found that what tends to come out the other end is an ad that looks that it will be interpreted one way by a consumer and another way by the regulators. And they draw a distinction between therapeutic claims, which can be regulated, and health claims, which can't, which are defined as claims that support normal physiological function. If you ever see an ad that says something like, supports joint health, that means nothing. It sounds like it means something. You could say, supports are good for a healthy heart. Doesn't mean anything. Um, <laughs> it's really frustrating. Um, and it's much more widespread than I would have thought. Um, pretty much, well, not pretty much every, a lot of ads you see, uh, just for general cold and flu stuff, they don't say cold and flu. They say winter ills and chills. And if I try to complain about that, I, I haven't because I can see what's going to happen, but I expect they come back and say, no, 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 that's just, you know, you're feeling a bit sniffly. It's not a cold, it's not a flu, we might not make any definite claims, so there's nothing to follow up on. And I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't really have anything prepared. What, what do we do about this? What do we do about it? Um, well, I've tried complaining, and there are a lot of ads I can and do complain about, but those don't seem to be among them. What I'm trying to do is tell people about it so that when they see a medical advertisement, they can say, look, this doesn't mean what it says. Tell people around you, this doesn't mean what it says. If something says, may relieve pain, it means may not relieve pain and hasn't been shown to relieve pain. Because you know, you're an advertiser, you're going to put your best foot forward. If it will relieve symptoms of cold and flus, you will say that. You won't say it will help prevent winter ills and chills. If it's going to help you regrow cartilage, you don't say good for joint health. You say that, and then you can say, and that it's good for joint health. So I think the biggest thing to do about it is awareness, because I don't think it's going to be as easy to change the regulations so that they will start upholding complaints about that. But it's, I guess, easier said than done. So that's why I'm talking about it here, though. Yes? Yeah. Apparently, New Zealand is one of the few places in the world that allows medications to be advertised on TV. Um, what I, oh, yeah. yeah, it's New Zealand and the United States of America are the only countries that let medicines be advertised directly to consumers, yeah. which is a terrible idea because it's, it's basically. Beer ads, doesn't it? <laughs> But, uh, consumers aren't good at making medical decisions based on advertisements. That's why we have doctors, because they know how to evaluate the data and make the decisions. Other countries let medicines be advertised to medical professionals, but not consumers. I'd just like to say, I just wonder what it says about us, that we are in the same category as America on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing good, I think, but I'm not sure how easy it can change. Yeah, yeah. There, there is one, more than one way to skin a cat. Um, we had an issue some years back with an Australian, um, Jesse O.B. My Heart, who was running a series of operations in Australia, including selling um, uh, about 85 mil of water, which had been blessed by Jesse, uh, and was being sold by various means. Um, I think it was while I had my broken leg, because he promised that if you put a sample of water next to the graphic on his computer, and hit the click button, it will beam Jesse O.B. My Heart's energies into the water and it would do wonderful things for your bones, etc. It didn't work for me. We complained, oh, then we found out that there was a guy up in Coromandel who was starting to import Jesse O.B. My Heart's range of products. Right, and he's selling his 85 mils for about $150, by the way. No guarantee. Uh, no guarantee. Uh, we went to the health people. They said it's just water, it's nothing to do with us, it's a Commerce Commission thing. Commerce Commission said it's nothing to do with us, it's sort of a healthy kind of product, talk to the Ministry of Health. At that point, I noticed that in amongst the hundred or so products he had on his, his website was the Mills and Boons Rejuvenate Your Marriage Water. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote to Mills and Boons Australia and said, has this man got permission to use your product name because he could well be bringing it to disrepute? And I got a letter back saying, we have passed this on to our legal department. Thank you very much for notifying us. Nice. So if you can't get any joy with the ASA, there are other ways around that kind of thing. On the flip side, when you've got really bad adverts, um, what do we do? No? The other way. When you've got bad programs or programs that you'd like to um, complain about, such as Sensing Murder or Dare to Believe, 
uh, you find out who the advertisers are in the spaces in between and say, I know you booked this advertising ages ago and you booked it on a time slot, but do you realize that your product is being associated with something that exploits vulnerable people? Do you really want to be seen in that fashion? And we found that we got quite good responses to that. Yeah, I'd just like to say that um, in my profession, I'm an audiologist, um, uh, I deal with a lot of hearing aids and so forth, and we have the same sort of uh, issues actually in that field with marketing, um, saying one thing that's worded in such a way that it seems that it's actually you know, a little better than it really is. Uh, the most common one tends to be um, yeah, this hearing aid will reduce background noise. And we're continually getting people coming to the clinic and saying, well, we're looking for that hearing aid that eliminates the background noise, thank you very much. Well, of course, the word of reduce versus eliminate is, is obviously um, a, a quite a fine legal distinction to record that. Um, whereas, you know, I mean, uh, consumers are seeing one thing from an actual fact that the uh, retailers, sorry, the marketing people with the hearing aids tend to just say something slightly different. Put in such a way to actually make it look a little bit better than it does. Um, part of my job actually as an educator of uh, audiology students is actually to try and actually educate uh, our own students that are, that are going to come out and become audiologists themselves, which make these same sort of distinctions because the same market people are trying to market these things to their clinicians themselves. And um, it takes quite a bit of time to actually sort of get students to think critically about what it is that the marketers are actually saying and how to really interpret what they're saying with a grain of salt. Has anybody seen that thing that went around and they had um, something like what an English person says and then what a European hears and what the English person means? Did anybody see that? Oh yeah. So like one of them was um, something like that's very interesting and so the, the European, European person would think ah they think my idea is interesting whereas what the English person means is you're crazy right? <laughs> I wonder whether we need something actually, and this is my challenge to you, because I'm not going to do it. So we need a list of some claims or words that are used, what the what the people think they mean and what the marketing people think they mean. One other thing I've thought of doing is making an imaginary focus product and advertising it in such a way that it would get past regulation as far as I know, even though it's complete full of shit, but I haven't done anything like that yet. Um, actually, at school at the moment, in media studies, we're studying the advertising standards authority and advertising in general. And um, have you looked at the advertising code of ethics? Because, yeah. because there is a clause in... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> apparently there is. It's not really binding. And one of the unfortunate things about our advertising in New Zealand is it's self-regulated. And so there are not actually specific laws about it. And even though the ASA tells the company that their ad is bad, they don't actually have to do anything about it. That's exactly right. There's but, actually... Oh, yeah, but there is in the Code of Ethics um, something that says there's two interesting ones. One, that you can't exploit the superstitious and one that you can't say anything that could be, that is misleading or is likely to mislead. So those are some things that you could maybe try and... Yeah, well, in. they actually have... Um, a, Therapeutic Products Advertising Code, which I use as it's a uh, advertising uh, ethics one, and there's the Therapeutic Products one, and that's actually pretty good in that they're required to substantiate their claims, so the, the burden of proof is in the right place, yeah. basically. But what you said about self-regulation, that's a really good um, point. Two big gripes I have with this regulation is it's self-regulated, there's no laws, it's voluntary, and the ASA doesn't make their own complaints, they rely entirely on consumers making complaints. So you can see something that's full of crap, and if no one has complained, then that's fine. They're not going to do anything about it. Um, so I saw on empathy then. Sorry? Who cares enough to make a complaint these days? Me? <laughs> good, good. Um, yeah. And I've actually had two complaints upheld about a month ago now, and the ads still haven't been taken down. Last I heard from the ASA was a week ago today that they were considering taking it to the appropriate statutory authority. Part of the problem is when I make a complaint, there's a way to get to sign where they say, if it's under our jurisdiction, you don't go to anyone else. So I have to wait for them to do it. Hopefully they do. Um, both of those complaints are about amber teething necklaces, which I've been focusing on because I don't like them. Yes. Uh, the other thing is, um, you could try maybe going to the government, because the government have imposed some laws over 
cigarette advertising and alcohol advertising, so they could possibly, uh, they probably won't because they're our government, but you could try and get them to put something in about health. Yeah, what I'm hoping with this, if it goes to comments questions, it will bring that to light a bit. I've looked at the Fair Trading Act and Medicines Act, but haven't gone score. I went once straight to the Commerce Commission, but they said the problem wasn't big enough, so I should go somewhere else. Hopefully with this, now that the ASA has shown to not be enough, they'll consider it, but I can run into go to it, which is frustrating. Yes, the back. I have a random idea for you to build on some of the ideas from here and here. Imagine if you put together two sets of claims, claims that were within the law, that kind of circumvent, you know, the main idea, and the actual ones that say what the, the product actually does. And ask people, you know, put them in two different groups, say, what do you infer from this? And demonstrate that that in fact happening. Demonstrate that people are interpreting the law-based ones in a way that lets them believe that this product will and stop the flu, where it'll heal my joints. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I'll, again, this is something I've thought about but haven't done, is doing a survey like that where you basically you have two ads or whatever and you say, what does this mean to you? And do you think that if they're saying this, it must be supported by evidence? And then that could hopefully be used to say, look, the law's not good enough, it needs to be better. But I think it will pass it first. One other way to do it is to write the companies directly and put them on notice, say, you say scientific evidence supports this, can you please supply that? I do that, I tend to not hear back. The good thing about um, contacting the ASA is, if they don't substantiate it, they get told to take it down. And ASA complaints that are upheld tend to generate some media attention, whereas I don't. Um, so if I do that, they don't hear back from them. If they're in New Zealand, I tend to do that, and that seems to be a good way to get the evidence out of them, or whatever just, they do. Just don't give them your phone number, because you will get abusive. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that advice. Yeah, this is it. Um, what if you were to send them, say, an email with I don't know, say, you know, I have cancer, will this fix it? And get them, see if they'll make a definite claim about it? Could you then use that? I could, but honesty is kind of my thing, so I'd rather not. What, I have the flu, what do you really have the flu? Yeah, I mean, if I were in a situation where I could be honest and do that, maybe. Yeah. But I try really hard to be honest with all the stuff that I'm doing. I was just talking. What are the most direct, direct interactions with the people representing these products? Because at Wellfest, I talked to the Shuzi and Chi um, salesperson there. Oh, she actually made the claim that it helps prevent cancer. That's the, and she also said they never put that on the website or in the brochure because people get slapped down by the ASA. Does that mean kind of. There's this really unfortunate out that they have where if you are a natural healthcare practitioner and you are dealing with a particular client you can basically tell them whatever you like so long as you don't advertise it generally um i don't know how far that can go but it's pretty crap so if if i were say a naturopath and you came to me with a problem i could say take this it will cure your cancer but I can't put a label on it that says cures cancer. Well, as far as I understand it, at least. As far as I understand it, that's the case. I'm not a lawyer, but from what I have read, that's what I'm pretty sure is the case. If I'm wrong, please tell me. They tend to be knows. cautious about using the word cure, but you can use the word True. heal, and you can use the mm. word treat. Um, uh, the the Jesse and Be My Heart people were healing dead people, which I found interesting. <laughs> awesome! Using their Stargate, right and, and their, their Stargate machine, which apparently read energies, Jesse's energies, back in time, so it would heal people who were dead. Sounds like Mormons baptizing people. Somebody was lying. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Okay, one more thing. Um, if anyone's interested, this bag is full of all the correspondence I've had from the ASA, and I'd be happy to show it to people if they're interested yes. in having a look. Thank you. What I got out of that was what is said, what is heard, and what is meant. The New Zealand Skeptic Society actually has a bit of money, and I'm seeing a full page advert in a national paper. 
Now, if you look at that data in detail, you see, not what he was saying, you actually see the temperature rises or falls first by about 800 years before CO2 follows, which is totally the opposite of what people are being taught about it. So there's, the link is not the way he would say it, it's the other way around. And if you look at the past history, the Vostok ice core goes about 450,000 years into the past. And you look at it, there's a, a regular cycle, about every 130, 140,000 years of ice ages. Cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, warm. The ice ages are um, about 100,000, 120,000 years apart. The interface of the warm period, about 10,000 years. What worries me, as a geologist, thinking about long term, is each of the ice ages gets colder and longer, and colder and longer, and colder and longer. Now we're at the peak, we're in the base of a warm period. To me, sure as eggs, we're going to go on an ice age. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe a hundred years, maybe a thousand years. But it's going to happen. There's nothing we can do to stop it. It's got nothing to do with CO2. Now, the, the theory behind CO2 increasing is fine. Because at the end of the little ice age in 1850, was when CO2 levels started to rise on the Earth. The CO2 levels started to rise, temperature started to rise, as it started to retreat. There has been essentially no change in the slope of the graph since 1850. It's got nothing to do with CO2 produced by man, because man-made CO2 started to increase about 1840, 1845, after the Second World War. Germany re as did Japan, and lots of coal and oil and natural gas were burned, so CO2 rise and grows. It's got nothing, it hasn't changed the slope of the graph at all. So, I can't see the reason why people are worried about global warming. And in fact, global warming to me is infinitely preferable to another ice age. I went to university in Montreal, Canada. Montreal in Canada was under a mile and a half of ice yesterday, geologically speaking. I expect it will be again in the future. If we can stop that, bring it on. Let's have CO2. CO2 is a plant food. CO2 is a plant food. We pump it into greenhouses to produce uh, better plant growth. There's more people in the world, we need more plants, we need more food, let's have CO2. Sea levels are rising slightly because the oceans are warming, not because of CO2, but man-made uh, fossil fuels, but because we're coming out of the little ice ages, coming out of solution in the oceans. So, what is the issue? I'm uh, more than happy to have questions. I've got them. Here we go. Have you heard... Have you heard of the graph, uh, the thin red patch? No. And is anybody here actually able to speak knowledgeably on that graph? Somebody must. No? Uh, basically, it's a meta study, and it talks about uh, the, the, the number of climate change talks, uh, sorry, climate change studies peer-reviewed studies and respectable journals that are pro, or, or have language that is, is pro-climate change versus uh, anti-climate change, you know, climate denialism effectively. And it's something like 97 point something percent pro. So given that weight of scientific peer-reviewed evidence and, and uh, uh, studies, how do you still follow up? the position you do. Um, who are the people in this study? Are they scientists? Are they, what, what is their background? Or are they journalists? Uh, it's, it's all peer-reviewed scientific journals. I would suspect that many of them would work uh, and produce reports for the IPCC, and we will hear tomorrow from Martin Manning, who has contributed to the IPCC. Um, all the, the IPCC is basically the political body, it's the, if, in case people don't know what the IPCC is, it's a UN body, which is a public body. It's called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So it is a political body under the auspices of the UN. Now, they produce a report every five, six, seven years. There's a new one coming out in September, AR5, um, which will be even more, I can tell you now, it's going to be even more scary than the last one. The media is being primed already to produce scary reports prior to this coming out, as it was in September, they'll be coming out very soon, and the newspaper coming to you, scary, scary reports, it's worse than we thought, it's going to be a disaster, and then the report will come out. 
Now, the IPCC is a political body. Um, they have, they base most of, the, most of their ideas on models. Computer models, sophisticated computer models. There's lots of jobs there for computer modelers. And they've done this for the last 20, 30 years. Now, not one of those numerous, if not hundreds of computer models, have been able to predict the fact that global temperatures have essentially stayed the same um, for the last 17 years. They're flatline and possibly slightly decreased for at least 17 years, if not 20. Now, some of you being skeptics will disagree with me. You'll be skeptical about that claim. But Pachuri, the head of the UN IPCC committee, admitted finally in Australia to the Australian newspaper this year he admitted there have been no global warming for the last 17 years. This is the head of the IPCC admitting that there has been no global warming despite the disaster predictions of his own body. So the models don't work, it's all based on modeling. Okay. Uh, we've just found the graph. <laughs> the actual numbers, I got the percentages wrong. I have evidence. I'm changing my opinion. Uh, there are 13,915 peer-reviewed climate change articles uh, between 1991 and 2012. 24 reject global warming. I would suggest if you were to look objectively at that, you would find a similar number of peer-reviewed articles in um, journals around the world that are skeptical of the point of view of man-made global warming. Just a small point on Bjorn Lomberg. Yes, he published a book called The Skeptical Environmentalist, rubbish in climate change, as you said. However, he's no longer on your side. He's changed his mind. He agrees it's happening. And what he's now saying is that we should devote all our energies to mitigating the effects of it, not to deny that it's happening. So that's a very good point. I don't deny that climate change is happening. But climate change has always happened, and always will. I have one question for the environmentalists to worry about this. When was the world perfect? Was it when they were born? 1900? Last year? The year of the Kyoto Treaty? When is this nirvana of ideal world, ideal temperature? When does that exist? Now, Beyond Homeport has He's a statistician, I believe. Yes, he is. He is. Yeah. And he has, he's a skeptic. He's produced another book called, um, I think, Cool It, about global warming since the environmental skeptical environmentalist. Now, I don't uh, uh, deny that climate change is happening, but climate change has happened all through the of history. It's happened, it's going to continue to happen. It's going to happen. So, what is the problem? This is no worse than what happened before, and there's no worse than what's going to happen in the future. Glaciers are retreating as they have since 1850, when the world started to warm at the end of the ice age. But the glaciers in the Alps and Swiss Alps and so on are retreating and exposing the remains of people that have crossed the Alpine passes in the past. So, obviously, the glaciers retreat further in the past. This is nothing new. Just so I'm not particularly knowledgeable about climate science and whatnot. The issue though I have with climate denial is that it's essentially a conspiracy theory. You're relying on climate scientists either fabricating evidence or stupid or just not really knowing what they're doing. You can cite these books, but they're not published articles. They're not actually taking part in the debate. They kind of make these claims themselves and you're not actually hearing the discussion between the experts. So, from my perspective, it's a conspiracy theory. And as skeptics, we shouldn't, in the same way we would accept from creationists, that biologists actually are totally wrong about evolution, that people are doing the work and don't know what they're talking about. With climate science, it's why are we not going with scientists? I'm a scientist. I know a lot of other scientists who agree with my point of view. They're not alone. We don't get much press. You don't want to be really nasty about it and say the IPCC is a government body. There are, as a, a little diversion here. As a geologist, I went to the University of Miguel, Montreal, Canada. I know the Geological Survey of Canada very well. I went back there a few years ago to do a bit of work. And the Geological Survey was not producing reports on the geology of Canada or how the prime minister was. It was producing reports on the effects of climate change on the St. Lawrence River Valley. 
you know, it's nothing to do with geology. And that was where the funding was coming from. If they could produce a report with the word climate change in it, they would get more funding. And this applies to university departments and the IPCC. If there was no global warming, there was no need for the IPCC. Why do climate scientists disagree? Thank you. Why, why are the climate scientists the ones saying? Well, I would suggest look at the funding. Now, they accuse us of being shills of the oral industry. It's not a conspiracy. They are looking towards research grants and keeping their uh, climate change uh, departments going. Yeah. Maybe that's being too soon. I still can't wrap my head around the fact that if um, what you're, you're accusing these governments of um, being against, sorry, of, of, of promoting the idea of climate change. But actually, it's in most governments' interests not to do that, right? Because the changes that we need to make are really, really costly, both to our lifestyles and to business. So I just don't understand. That, that to me just doesn't doesn't make any sense. Because because if anything, the governments would be saying, "Oh, this isn't happening because we don't want to make all these changes." So to me, that kind of points that then there must be something happening. <laughs> I, I don't understand either. It's a very good question. I don't understand. Can I make a comment? Yeah, that's an excellent book. Uh, I think it's oh, it might be the smoke screen. I'm sorry, sir. There's an excellent book. The title might be the smoke screen about how the same public publicists and political background, you know, behind the scenes people. Uh, have been organising the trial of tobacco. And I've, I'm sorry, since it's just come into my head this moment, quite a few other things, and they're currently working on denying climate change. The, the big business is interested in this, and their interest is not in objectivity. I mean, just, I'm sorry to side this, but Bayer is currently uh, uh, taking the European communities to court so that they continue to promote pesticides that kill bees. Okay, that's a good point. It must be a little bit off topic, as they would say. But, but fair enough. No, I think the city is perhaps behind this, and um, certainly the insurance companies like Munich Re and those reinsurance crowds overseas are behind this in a big way, a very big way, because they are in the carbon futures market. And the carbon market is a market on trading on gas in the atmosphere, for God's sake. It's absolutely ridiculous. But they're behind it because every trade that takes place, they take the commission. And it's kind of like, uh, was, is Vicky still here? About the insurance companies in price groups. I mean, for goodness sake, we're all out of paying hugely increased insurance premiums um, on all our policies. And the Christchurch earthquake is just mild from heaven from the insurance company. It's, they've been waiting for decades, and it's finally happened. Thank God it's happened. They can now double our insurance policy and say, oh, it's Christchurch. One of them went broke. Yeah, well, they should not go broke. Just a small part on your dumping the IPCC as a political body as if that was a crime in itself. The point is it was, it was set up deliberately to advise on to advise governments on whether or not climate change was happening, and if so, how much and on what time scale, and it to imply what it is that they should be doing about it. It was deliberately set up as a political body to give governments advice. So it's stupid, if you don't mind the sense of it, to be to be decried because it was a political body. That's its function. Exactly. It's not a scientific body, it's a political body. Exactly. It does, it does have scientists, okay. It does have scientific scientists, a lot of which, and Martin Manning is one of them, who contribute to it. They produce the scientific documents. However, the IPCC um, releases first the summary of these documents, produced not by scientists, the summary produced by politicians. And people, like uh, people from Sudan who, uh, to a suspect, have not much experience in climate change, they, these politicians, these government people, produce the summary, which goes to the media, and that's what people base their ideas on. We're out of time, are we? We're kind of pushing on for time, so we'll take one more question. 
Hey, yeah, it's a bit of a fancy question. Um, all of us care very deeply and passionately about the discussion tonight. Uh, how do we get people who aren't interested in what we're talking about, interested in it and fascinated and um, they actually care? That's, that's a really good question. Does anybody want to answer it? Yeah. Mm. If you get onto your journalist friends, the journalist speak with um, Deborah Adele's wife's not here, is she? And Adele's not here, she's a journalist, a bit of a journalist too. Um, bad news sells. Until we can change that mindset, we're in trouble. I mean, we've had some very cold winters in Europe in the last few years. You don't hear about it, you just hear about the warming. And if, we, if global warming is not happening, this is good news. Surely it's good news. We don't hear about it. All we hear about is the gloom and doom. So the problem lies with the journalists. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rob Campbell, come up and talk to us about extended consciousness. You have to go. Oh, you're kidding. That sounds good. Cool. Hugh, Hugh Young, come up, talk to us about Mary Duval talks to dead people. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to appoint you as I'm going to appoint you as my human microphone stand. And I'm going to appoint a couple of other human lecterns. And also, I'm going to put this damn thing on the floor because it is making the table this night and it's doing my head in. It's also past my bedtime. I'm very old and I'm actually probably the second surviving member, foundation member of the Skeptics. Near, near enough to uh, Warwick Don is probably the last. Well, Vicky, Vicky, were you here at the... Were you a family member? No, I'm not. I came in in 1990. Fair enough. 84. Okay, thank you. I'm a young person, I keep telling you. Okay. <laughs> now, so, I have uh, uh, two stories to tell, or one story to tell about two people who are quite closely connected. Why did they do that? It's because I'm, you're in front of me. Keep the mic cheek. Okay, is that weird? No. Oh, damn it. Oh. Sorry? It's a, it's a unidirectional mic. You've got to uh, talk into my mouth then. But don't point to... Okay. The two people are, uh, first, Harold Bennett, who was born about 1924, and Marie Duval, who was born in 1938. Uh, I should tell you that Marie Duval was born Carolina Maria Gambia. She was born in Milan. Harold Bennett was born in Palmerston North. Uh, Harold Bennett very much loved aeroplanes and he went off and in the, during the Second World War he was in the fleet air arm. He survived the Second World War and he came back and he met my sister and they got married and had four children and 10 grandchildren, and they had a long and happy life. My sister had a, a shop in, you may remember, the Victoria Corner Market, so they lived quite well. They, I think they probably, were, he was probably in government superannuation. He had a happy retirement, and um, I'll save one touch for later, and you're probably going to get the punchline. Marie Duval, a clairvoyant and spirit medium with a society of psychic and parapsychic studies. 40 years of accurate and verifiable predictions. And I think you will agree, I'll just show you, uh, Joel, is she a beautiful young woman? <laughs> she's, good, she's, a good, she's, she's a good looking woman. I imagine a number of people would consider her attractive. Yeah. Well, she, she was born in 1938. for the expert of business. Okay, well, in 2011, she wrote to Harold Bennett 
And she wrote, after getting the lottery numbers many times in a row, you are the person I've decided to help to win now. Dear Harold, in a few days' time, I'm going to consult the future for you to discover the numbers that should scoop out one of the biggest lottery prizes for the month of February, with your approval, of course. And then I'll send them to you. I'm going to tell you why, but first... Blah, 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 blah. Um, How much did it cost? So, uh, you should know who I am. First of all, Harold. So what's lots and lots of glowing testimonials for her. Harold, I want to use my psychic power talents to know you better and to confirm that you are the deserving person I already sensed you were. I was deeply moved by what I saw. That's handwritten, or rather it's in a typeface that looks like handwriting. Your life hasn't always been very easy. You often feel that you are dogged by an abnormal amount of bad luck. In spite of everything you have endured, you have always found the courage to carry on fighting for yourself and for those you love. But now you're definitely feeling discouraged and visibly at the end of your tether. And it seems that money is the biggest problem for you. You need some right now. Well, as I mentioned, he, he, they, 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 never, they never wanted. Uh, in their retirement, they went to, 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 had some overseas travel. He was also, um, he was a, um, after his, he retired as a pilot, he um, joined civil aviation and he tested pilots. And this led to several overseas tours in, they spent some months in Fiji and Vanuatu testing pilots there. But I should mention, since she said with such terrible luck he's had, in the 1950s in the Air Force, he was flying a jet, I think it might have been a Mustang or a Vampire, but um, in, I think it was a jet. Um, although it doesn't seem likely that he actually went on the jet. Anyway, there were three of them. They were in formation. The other two touched wingtips and crashed, and both the other pilots died. He was the only survivor. This man with this bad, bad luck. And so it goes on. He, she, she wants Harold to uh, fill in this form with some personal details, including his date of birth. And I think you're going to get the punchline. She doesn't ask for his date of death which was in 2004, <laughs> seven years before she wrote to him. But there's not only, not only it does Harold have an interesting relationship with the real world, so does Maria Duval. According to Wikipedia, Maria Duval uh, was the owner of Astro Force until it was sold in 1997 to Health Tips Limited in Hong Kong, now Harmony Limited, then she became blah, blah, blah. Aeroforce has since been acting as Maria Duval with her consent and knowledge. They also use her name for a world-known worldwide scam. And this is Wikipedia. <laughs> and methods of observation. Complaints about letters of Aero Astroforce were upheld by the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK in December 1999. So, anyway... And still running. And, uh, yes. Well, clearly they're still running. Oh, and um, in 2005, Astro Force stopped it in its New Zealand advertising, this is Wikipedia, after a complaint by the Consumers Institute of New Zealand. But clearly they're still working from overseas. How is Suzanne Paul still operating? <laughs> How? I don't know. <laughs> True though, true though. Maria Duval is listed on their scams on the Commerce Commission site, one of very few ones that have actually bothered, been bothered to list. And it was nice to see, given that my stepfather in law's mother <laughs> spent something like $45,000 on getting psychic numbers from that. Dang, dang. So much for the inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, to wind up, Harold did not answer her advertisement. Still there. Gina? 
Gina will be talking to us about transcranial direct current stimulation. That's all the press I've got. Hi, I'm Gina, and I'm a cognitive neuroscientist at Vic. And I um, do research on brain mechanisms that allow us to pay attention to our world and understand it and respond particularly to emotional things and control our emotional responses to those things. And one of the tools that I use in my research is something that we call transcranial direct current stimulation, which from now on I'm going to call TDCS. Because it's like kind of a bit of a mouthful. Um, and I'm really not going to spout my science at you all, um, although I'm always happy to talk about it afterwards. What I really want to talk about today is the fact that this technology, TBCS, which we use in our research, which I think is a really cool research tool, is actually available and marketed on the internet, and you can go now and buy it if you really want. So, in fact, uh, www.pope.us. Uh, you can buy a TDCS system that will run 1 milliamp of current through your brain, $249 US, shipped to New Zealand. Um, and so I really just sort of wanted to, to, to put this out there and tell you a little bit about what TDCS is. Um, I'm not going to say it doesn't work or it does work. I'm going to say that this is a developing technology uh, that we're learning a lot about right now. The idea of running electricity through your brain to enhance cognitive function, that's what it's marketed for, uh, has been around for about 2,000 years. Um, the Romans were doing it uh, with electric fish, uh, applied to the head. Uh, Sturbonius, in his writings, talked about applying electric fish to the head as a cure for a headache. So, so this is a pretty ancient technology. Um, we're talking about, about a 1 milliamp current um, that you run for about 10 minutes. And what it does, it does have an actual effect on brain tissue. So what it's actually doing, it's a, um, under the anode, you've got two electrodes, an anode and a cathode, and you're running a current between them. You put an electrode here, electrode here, wherever you're going to put them on your head. And you run it, and under the anode, what you get, if you can imagine, you've got neurons, I'm going to do this. Neurons are like this, um, close to each other, and they talk to each other. So all the thoughts that we have are our neurons talking to each other. And what TDCS does is it lowers the threshold a tiny little bit to make it easier for those neurons to talk to each other. So this is why we talk about it as a neuroenhancer or a neurofacilitator. Um, my concern as a scientist about this is that we are studying this in our lab because we don't know how it works. Uh, we, know, we know roughly what it's doing to neural tissue, but of course we don't know what the effect of that is on your thoughts and your behaviors. And so that's what we're doing in our studies. Um, but it's now being marketed um, for treatment of pain, for treatment of depression, uh, and the, the focus, the one that you can buy for $249, is beautifully set up to stimulate your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is a, an area of your brain that's involved in controlling what you're attending to at any particular time. And it's being marketed specifically to video gamers. Um, really, I'm really quite serious. So if you go on the Focus website, um, this is a system, it's, it's, it's almost identical to the system I use in my lab, except it's way cheaper. Um, and, and it doesn't have an impedance monitor built into it, we can talk about what that means. So I'm, I'm actually a little doubtful about whether it's actually delivering current the way that it's actually set up. But um, the idea is, it says very clearly on their website that it is not FDA approved, that it is not being marketed as a medical device or treatment. It is only to enhance your video gaming experience. Um, again, this is an area of the brain that it's targeting that's specifically involved in attention. Um, so that's clearly what the goal of, of this is. Uh, in my own ethical requirements for using TDCS, I can use it for up to 10 minutes at um, up to two milliamps. You can run the focus for 40 minutes. Um, I'm willing to bet that video gamers might, you know, there's nothing to stop you from running it for another 40 minutes after that, and another 40 minutes after that, because you know, video gaming is known to be one of those things that people can just stop and turn off anytime. <laughs> um, 
So, and, and again, I don't want to be the, the skeptic who says, don't do this, it's bad for you, or the skeptic who says, don't do this, it doesn't work. Um, we don't know. Um, this is just one of those cases where this is ongoing and it's developing. And um, so I just kind of wanted to put this out there for you to think about. You'll, you might start to see it more and more in marketing. Um, certainly it's all over the internet. There are DIY communities of people who, I go online and I'm horrified. People saying, oh yeah, you need to stimulate here, and you need to do it for this number of minutes, and you need to target these areas. We don't know. If you stimulate an area of your brain here, you can get activity here. Um, your brain is actually all connected. And so we really are still working and trying to understand. I think it has great potential um, as in terms of, you know, you think about taking a drug to affect your brain, it's going to affect your whole brain. Whereas if we could actually, actually target a specific system, it might be actually much more effective, have fewer side effects. It has potential, but again, we don't, I don't, I don't think it's ready for this sort of prime time use at this point. So I am happy to answer questions. Matt! Hi, Gina. I liked your um, representation of the neurons. Like yes, this. neurons. <laughs> Go okay. neurons. So yeah. the question I have yeah. is, well, so that you're saying that this mechanism that you're describing increases the flow of communication between the two neurons. Yeah, I, it depolarizes. Slightly under the anode, it slightly depolarizes those membranes. So if you're if you're two neurons that need to communicate with each other, that means that this neuron doesn't have to work so hard to make this neuron fire. So it's not like other types of brain stimulation that you might have heard about, like ECT, for example, that is going to cause neurons to fire. A TDCS is never going to cause a neuron to fire. It's going to make it easier for two neurons that were talking to each other already to continue talking to each other. So uh, the yeah. question I have then, yeah. based on that, and I like the description you provided, are there things other than this product that will actually increase the communication between the neurons? For example, Thinking? if I drink beer, <laughs> I go for a run or something, other ways that don't require me to put something on my cranium. Absolutely. Um, your, your brain is, is a thing that is continually responding to all of the stimuli that we apply to it in all sorts of ways. Um, and so, you know, I, my voice right now is causing hair cells to bend on your cochlea and produce neural impulses. So we are continually putting electric, electricity into our brains. Uh, we can think, we can eat, we can interact with people, we can giggle. All of these things, these interactions between us and our environment are our brains responding to things that are going on around us. I, I don't see this as tremendously different from that. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I may have missed it while I was, I was getting a drink, but... Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Uh, you're, you're what does this feel like? What does it feel like? Ah, oh, great question. And in fact, if you're starting to look at the research, you should really ask that question is, because one thing that is a concern when we're studying it in the lab is are we seeing a placebo effect? Because people believe that this thing is going to actually enhance their cognition. Um, I'm personally a big fan of the placebo effect. I think that a good placebo is worth its weight in gold. Um, but uh, it does have two modes. So we have a sham mode, but what it, it tingles. It definitely tingles, particularly when you first turn it on, when you get a little bit of buzz. Mostly that's the, the salts that are um, on, in, on your skin ionizing, and so you get a tingling sensation, and then that tends to fade away. So in the lab, when we're testing this, what we do is active stimulation, we run it for 10 minutes. In sham stimulation, we run it for about 30 seconds and then we ramp it off and then for the next nine and a half minutes you get nothing. People can't tell which is which because nobody knows what it's supposed to feel like and it does drift away but once you've had it once then you know. So what I find is I can tell whether it's on or not. So I think that actually despite the fact that it technically has a sham mode, I think most people can tell the difference between sham and real, which is a problem for us as researchers. Does it feel good? <laughs> it, it, it just kind of 
feels like a tingle. Um, but people report that afterwards, uh, or even during, uh, we definitely see improved, uh, one of the, the strongest effects that you'll see with it is improved working memory. So ability to do more, thing, more hold more cognitive operations in memory at a, at a time, for example. That's kind of one of the things that's specifically marketed for. Yeah? Sorry, what's tingling? That's what there's no name inside your... Ah, no, it's only your skin that's tingling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I've been audiology conference at the actually, just... Oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah, sorry. I went to an audiology conference at the meeting yeah. actually just uh, only a few months back actually where uh, a guy named Dirk the writer um, was talking about uh, using this technique yeah. actually with um, respect to treating tinnitus. Yes, and great potential. Yeah, it does. Um, and so it's only a very limited sort of short term effect. It doesn't yeah. seem to actually have an you know, improvement and, and you know, they're using the, the, the exposed sham um, sort of uh, yeah. paradigm to, to improve the yeah. effect. It, it does have it does have real potential. Um, I know uh, a colleague of mine, Ben Thompson, up in Auckland, is looking at using it to treat amblyopia, lazy eye. Uh, that you can create some a little bit of essentially your lazy eye, the, the good eye over dominates the bad eye, but the bad eye is actually still getting visual input, and so that he's essentially using TBCS to suppress the good eye. So that the cells that are responding to the bad eye can learn to learn to work a little bit, and is having some and is having some success with that as well. So, I, I, but again, early days, way early days. Yeah. Just one other point too that I was thinking about. Um, it just goes back to about the um, the uh, commercially available system yeah. that you talked about. What's a commercially available? Um, do you sort of uh, stress that actual battery is not much different than just a car battery. So no, it's as well actually. It's a 9 volt battery. That's really what it is. It's like ridiculously low tech. I can't believe how much mine cost um, because it's medically approved and all of that sort of stuff. Crazy amount of money for, for really what's a 9 volt battery and two electrodes. Yeah. So you said it's being used to suppress um, one eye sort of thing. Yeah. Um, How is it used differently if one it lowers the threshold and the other suppresses? Ah, excellent question. Okay, so the question was how can you use it to suppress as well as to enhance? So you've got an anode and a cathode. And so what you get under the anode is depolarization of membranes. What you get under the cathode is hyperpolarization. So in fact, you can get you can get the reverse effects under the cathode, but not always. It depends on the brain area. So if you have, we have a lot of it. A lot of our brain is inhibiting other parts of our brain, and so if you inhibit the inhibitory part of our brain, you kind of weird things can happen. So, um, so it doesn't work as the, the cathode inhibiting doesn't work as nicely as, as for a lot of cognitive things. It works pretty well in the motor system. It works pretty well in the visual system that are kind of straight up. Uh, but in, in more complex systems where you have multi-brain areas being part of a network. Um, effects are a little unpredictable. But, yeah. Yeah. How targeted is it? You've mentioned yeah. affecting different parts of the brain by putting electrodes in different places. If I'm two millimeters out of my finger on my own internet, I like yeah. to affect the wrong part of my brain? Uh, possibly. The electrodes are pretty big in TVCS, yeah, so it's a really blunt tool, um, to be honest. So we have other tools that we use in the lab. We use um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, where we can really, really target a specific area, and it's navigate. We use a neuro navigator and, and everything. TDCS, you can only really get surface sorts of areas, uh, and our electrodes are yay big by yay big, um, and so so we sort of go, ooh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that's right there. <laughs> Simple, it's it's here. Um, sway your results. I mean, if you think of it, hitting an area of this big rather than that big, do you weigh your results based on that? Yes. Oh. Yes. So, um, yeah, the effects are nowhere near what we see with with really targeted magnetic sorts of things. It's generally what you're looking for is a slight enhancement or an improvement in learning. That's one of the things. So, if you think about your neurons, learning is two neurons becoming sort of permanent, more permanently linked. Uh, if you run stimulation during learning, that linkage can happen more quickly. Yeah, but it's really not very targeted. Yeah. Do you feel smarter? Do you feel smarter? Do you feel smarter? 
actually a smart I I don't feel much of anything, so I'm pretty skeptical. So. Yeah. Is ECT still used anywhere? And yes. What, what average range is it? Okay, so just for comparison purposes, uh, TDCS is one to two milliamps. Two milliamps is pretty much the top end of where you would go with, with TDCS. It tingles. Um, ECT is typically, I, I, I don't work in the ECT field, so I'm just citing what, what I, I know of goes on, of 800 milliamps. So that's a, that's a big difference. Um, the point of ECT, ECT is not the ECT itself, it's the seizure. So the idea of ECT is that it's just enough electricity to induce a seizure, um, and, and that's why it's used. So TDCS is, yeah, one eight hundred of what we're talking about with ECT. How about TENS? TENS I don't know too much about, actually. It's an alternating um, sort of effect, um, and I've certainly I have no researchers talk about it with muscle work, but I haven't, um, nobody I know is applying it to brain. Yeah? So if two milliamps is enough to bring the threshold down about what would be the threshold? Oh, uh, Actually, oh, I've yeah. Question okay, because what you're talking about is making a neuron fire. Basically, yeah, how, where the line is, where the disposal threshold makes it fire. I don't think you can do that with TCCS at all, actually. Well, I'm just wondering yeah. if, if it were a higher, M, a higher um, current, what the current would be, and where the threshold is, would go over the space of fire. Does that make sense to find a Yeah, I don't think it actually does. Sorry. Yeah. No, Sorry. that's okay. That's okay. But that's what we use magnetic stimulation for. So you can use magnetic stimulation to produce a big enough, so it, it translates into an electric current when it, it interacts with neural tissue, and that can cause override the threshold and make a neuron that was just chilling and doing its thing actually fire. But TDCS can't do that. Yeah. Are you looking for test funnies? I want to volunteer. Uh, volunteers? Oh, somehow I, it would be entirely unethical for me to recruit research participants amongst this crowd. Um, but somebody somewhere will put my name on a website, right? Yeah. Um, uh, we have a lab website at Victoria University, uh, where the, there's all sorts of information about the studies that we are running. And if you'd like to volunteer, you could go to our lab website and find out how to do that. Yeah? Is it easier with bald people? <laughs> oh, no, bald people are a pain. Really? Yes, <laughs> because you have all of this like fabulous, um, like skin. tough skin. Yeah, yeah. So you would think bald would be really, really good. But in fact, what we really want to do is kind of rough up the skin. Um, to get a good current. And this is actually one of the reasons I can't remember. <laughs> uh, we, yeah, we, have, we call it exfoliating in the lab, but uh, what we're doing is removing the top layer of skin before we apply the electrode. Um, the, uh, um, this is one of the reasons I actually am really doubtful about the systems you can buy on the internet. In, in the lab, we have to do a lot of prep work on the head to get a good current running across the brain. And so I personally am really doubtful of a system that allows you, it's, it, it's, it looks like straight out of Star Trek. You know that episode where Jordy has the whole, like the video game thing on his head? Anyway, so it looks just like that. And it's not really requiring the same level of connection and there's no impedance monitor. And so, I mean, part of me feels good because I think that really it's doing nothing. Um, but. You know, but again, placebo, go for it. Yeah. Any other? All right, thanks. Years ago now, 
Um, and the basic message of this book is that how to get all the health and wealth and happiness that you want in your life is to simply imagine it. And when you imagine these good things that you want, you will start resonating at the same frequency as these things. Uh, and then through this uh, previously unknown law of attraction, universal law of attraction, the universe will bring these good things to you. Um, I don't think I'm going to have to do a lot of work to convince this crowd that is a fairly implausible idea. <laughs> Um, but as with so many um, false beliefs, untruths out there, there is um, a little grain of truth in there. Um, so I am a PhD student at Victoria University, um, also doing psychology. Um, and uh, over a decade ago now, so long before I was actually interested in psychology, um, some researchers overseas were doing work showing that in some cases, um, some of the things that we imagine can actually influence um, outcomes for us down the road. So um, in, the, in one study, they got a bunch of students who were um, going to sit an exam, put an exam in a couple of weeks, and they divided them into thirds. And one third, they said, um, imagine the outcome that you want. Imagine getting an A plus on this test. So, you visualize yourself walking down the hallway to the board where you know the results are going to be posted. Visualize yourself running your finger down until you come to your student number and then across, seeing that A plus there, feeling really amazing and happy and really pleased with yourself that you got this A plus. So we'll call that the, the outcome group. Um, another third were asked to imagine instead the processes that they would have to go through in order to get that A plus. So imagine themselves sitting down at their desk shutting their door so that their annoying flatmate doesn't come in and talk to them, turning off the radio, turning off the TV, all of that kind of thing, and getting out their books and, and studying. So that's our, our process group. And then the third group was uh, the control group. They were simply asked to monitor uh, the amount of study they did um, going into this exam. And so um, a few weeks later, when the researchers, when all the exams had been marked, the researchers went back and looked at how these students had actually done um, and what they found was that the process group so the group that imagined themselves studying for the test and doing the things they would need to do to um, do well on the test had actually got better marks on the test um, compared to the control group but the outcome group so the ones that had just imagined themselves getting the A plus without actually imagining all of the work that would have to go into that were no different from the control group um, so uh, the, sort of the takeaway message from that is, um, oh, so I should also mention the researchers kind of looked a little bit deeper and asked, they rang up this, all of the students the night before the test and asked them, um, how much study have you actually done? So how many hours have you put in? And also how, how anxious are you feeling about this test? And they found that um, the people who had who were in the process group had actually ended up putting in more hours and were feeling uh, more confident going into the test. So this is all uh, very interesting. My research is um, kind of at the next step from there, if you like, where I, I'm interested in looking at whether um, imagined future events can not, um, not just influence what happens to us down the road, but whether they can, um, I guess, act backwards in time, if you like, and uh, affect how we behave or guide our behavior in the present. Um, so this is a this sort of pretty big um, issue that I'm really only in the early stages of um, examining, but I'll just briefly tell you about um, the first study that I've, um, well, I and other members of my lab have uh, conducted to try and um, look at this, this issue. So what we do is we ask people um, to tell us about an event that they've imagined happening to them in the future that they've used to help them deal with a present situation. So people, um, this is a student population that we're asking about these things, and so um, they say things like, I imagine graduating, I imagine walking across the stage, um, and my parents are there, and I'm really happy, and they're really proud. And I, when I think of this, I, I think of this when I'm trying to motivate myself to study. Um, 
and, and thinking of this helps me to push on through and keep studying even though I desperately don't want to. Or things like, um, I imagine the day in life of future me if I quit university and went to work in a cafe, putting on my sensible shoes, getting on the bus, um, and spending all day on my feet going, what kind of coffee would you like? Um, and and so this, this particular person then goes on to say, and she decided after visualizing that, that she really, that wasn't so much the future that she wanted for herself, and that motivated her enough to kind of get out of bed and get on with her assignment. Um, so after people have described these, um, what, what we call directive future thoughts, we then ask them, well, what, what are they like? Um, how vivid are they? Um, do they? Do they affect your mood at all? How often do you think about them? Um, are they positive or negative for you? Um, and what we find when we compare them to um, memories that people say they use to help them is that they're just as vivid, even though they're just imaginary events. And they actually have a greater effect on um, mood and greater intensity of feelings that accompany them. And people are thinking about them, talking about them uh, more often. So obviously this is um, quite a preliminary step um, in that it's only evidence that people report using imagined future events to help them in the present. Um, but I think it is suggested that this is certainly a line of study worth pursuing. And obviously what I would really like to do next is um, get into more experimental approaches where we give people specific scenarios to imagine where there's um, some kind of message or life lesson for them to extract and then see if they can um, apply that life lesson to a situation we put them in in the present. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm working on implementing at the moment. Um, so maybe next time there's a conference I'll be able to come and tell you how far I've gotten in the interim. Um, but I'll just leave you I guess with the take home message that um, it's all very well imagining the future that you want, but to really achieve um, health, wealth, and happiness, it's actions, not imagination alone, that will get you there. longitudinal studies, it's just been one snapshot of time, although, yeah, you're right, that could be um, something really interesting to look at, um, perhaps even sort of give people a scenario to imagine and then come back to them later and say, have you used this to help you at all over, over time? Yeah. Uh -huh. Are you aware of uh, a similar technique that uh, elite sportsmen and women would use to enhance their performance? Yeah, yeah. Um, I certainly wouldn't say I know a heap about that literature, but I do know that there have been some studies done looking at um, more at the effects of, of imagining um, yourself practicing your skill. So as well as sort of physically practicing your skill, um, sort of visualizing it and imagining um, how you would do it. And I know that mental practice is better than no practice at all. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I imagine this sort of thing definitely could help um, sports people. And actually, that is something that I um, would be interested in looking at, is asking professional athletes, what do you think of to, to motivate you? Um, yes. Seeing whether they sort of spontaneously tell me about specific memories or specific um, sort of future things that they imagine. So I imagine standing on the podium, um, it feels great, and I've got the gold medal or whatever. Yeah. It's been specific work with um, goal kickers. Uh, visualising the ball going over the goal, and from what I recall, they had a significantly better percentage of successful goal kicking than those who didn't. Mm, that's interesting. Um, yeah. That yeah. study has actually been replicated with people shooting groups. With, with, with the people shooting groups. Yeah, I mean, Dan Carter used to, it must be right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I think it's actually uh, pretty sort of documentary back in the 70s mm -hmm. about the, the motivation or thinking of elite athletes. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that stage, New Zealand had quite a few more go crack, so to speak. A lot of them, and all visualised a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they should just probably um, 
mentioned that this imagination and visualization aren't necessarily the same, and so um, visualization, I would say, is an aspect of imagination. You can um, imagine things without necessarily seeing them very clearly in your mind's eye. But um, yeah, so John, John Walker, for instance, uh, regularly drove down the motorway. It was a mile marked on the motorway, and and uh, uh, fifteen hundred. Uh, there were various marks that were critical points in a mile race an off ramp and so forth. And he visualized how he'd run the race over a mile using those marks as he drove to work. And he, he, he put a big effort on that last 200 yards or whatever it was. He had a, a, he had a strategy. I'd like you just to, to um, elaborate a little bit more on just what you said at the end there, um, because I think what some of us have been talking about is actually um, the visualisation techniques, which I think is pretty well established part of sports science now, particularly with uh, utilising motor neurons as a prime action in, in muscle groups and so forth. But um, in terms of, you talk about imagination being a little bit different from visualisation and stuff, so can you elaborate a little bit more on that for us? Sure, well, um, so when I, when I talk about um, imagined future events or I tend, actually tend to refer to them as episodic future thoughts. Um, and so one of the, well, the hallmarks of these being episodic future thoughts is that you get um, a sense of, of um, sort of pre-experiencing, almost as if you're mentally traveling in time to experience this event. Um, and so there are lots of elements to that sense of ex pre-experiencing. Um, so one is, um, seeing the event clearly in your mind's eye, which is kind of that visualization aspect, but then you might also hear it um, or smell or taste certain things. You might be able to see the physical surroundings, um, or you might sort of specifically see other people there, or be able to, um, it might be more in words than in pictures. Um, and then also with that comes all the sort of emotion, mood kind of um, aspects as well. So it's not necessarily just about seeing something, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Johnny G. Split brain studies and the implications for an immortal, indivisible soul. I'm <laughs> oh, surprised you're even writing, that's pretty good. <laughs> Um, where do we want to start here? Um, perhaps the piece I should really ask is, just to probably go by where I go with this, um, how many people here have heard of uh, split brain studies before? They put your hand up if you have. So that's about, um, probably it's about a half. Okay, I should, I should go over it. Um, how many people here know about the lateralization of um, the cerebral hemispheres in terms of um, uh, sensation and um, the, uh, the, the motor action as well. So what I mean by that, um, does everyone here sort of know that, say, the right part of your body is dominated or, or, or um, sensation from that goes to the left hemisphere and, you know, first, first, you know, that side, yep, there's a few hands going up. Um, and likewise, um, the motor action, you know, goes down the same way as well. Okay. Back in, I think it's the 1950s, 1960s, um, some studies were done uh, with people who uh, were epileptics, and um, in a way to, to try and stop epilepsy going from one hemisphere to the other, uh, the corpus callosum, the, the part of the brain that actually um, connects the two cerebral hemispheres, and sort of surgically cut again to try and stop um, the uh, epileptic sort of bits, if you like, uh, going from one, brain to the, one side of the brain to the other as well. Um, some rather interesting, oh, for those that don't know, it's rather interesting sort of. Uh, effects seem to come up, uh, crop up in people when this sort of happens. Um, the most important one really being that actually, obviously, the, the not just the information from the... Uh, uh, oh, sorry, that's only... The fact that the uh, information transfer from one part of the brain to the other part of the brain is being disconnected with this um, means that, in actual fact, um, you know, uh, effectively, people appear to actually have two separate personalities when this sort of happens. So there's a whole bunch of studies that have been done that uh, tested effectively how 
um, people uh, perceive that information, particularly, uh, I don't know why I'm bringing it a little bit here, sorry about this, um, information from the right visual hemisphere, again, goes to the left, uh, sorry, the right visual hemisphere goes to the left side of the brain, and the, you know, obviously the left visual hemisphere goes to the right side of the brain. When you uh, sort of present information to just one hemisphere, then uh, that transfer of information can't go across the further of the brain. So uh, when you actually ask people, oh sorry, one of the, a, a very important aspect of this bit too is actually knowing a little bit about the speech centres of the brain too. So um, again, many of you might know that most of the speech centres in the brain typically lateralise to the left hemisphere, hence the, the right side of the body if you like. Um, what we tend to find from that is that, uh, again, when you're presenting information to one hemisphere, that actually the, uh, when it's presented to the right visual hemisphere, again, the left part of the brain can actually report on that. So let's say, um, I don't know, a classic, classic one of these was actually uh, if you uh, put up a, a picture of a, a crow's foot, the person would actually say, yes, I saw a crow's foot. If you try doing the same thing to the other hemisphere, it generally won't be able to report that back. Okay. Uh, sorry, the person with the split brain won't be able to report that back to you. Uh, whereas, of course, in, in everyone else, that's, that's not a problem. Um, okay. Uh, does that seem reasonably clear? Does anyone sort of not really get where I'm going with that? Okay. But the, 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 the point I wanted to ask next is how many people here sort of realise what implications that actually. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, the. the Obvious thing when you start looking at these things is actually what people do as I said present as though they've got two different personalities that happen on each side of the, the brain there. And the implications, if you don't really know that, is that um, for, if we think about the soul, I know I'm preaching to the person who won't believe in the soul, but um, the reason I bring this up is because actually I think it's a really important tool that we can use to actually sort of talk to um, non skeptics and, and uh, people who do believe in spirituality that actually really souls probably don't exist. Or at least they don't exist in the way that most people tend to think about them as such. Um, so I'm going to go again here. Um, okay, so if we uh, got a situation where one particular person who has one particular you know, sense of personality, if you like, can then actually have that personality disrupted by having the corpus callosum cap or, or the, the good spirit um, transfer of information cap. And then the person reacts as though they've got two separate personalities, then I, I think you can probably see that as a, as a quite a, a strong implication for the idea of what we call an indivisible soul. Okay. Um, actually, I'll put your hand up, put your hand up if you already sort of knew this, or is this actually something that seems to be new for people here? So it's something new. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense, or did you do know this beforehand? Better column A, better column B. Yeah, okay, cool. Alright, so uh, if you think about the, this, um, this, the way I see it, there's actually four different possibilities here. Okay, so the person again has, um, if you cut the corpus callosum and the person uh, reacts to the two now, two different se separate personalities, then one obvious one is that, okay, no soul exists. Okay, when you cut the corpus callosum, um, the, the, the um, you know, you haven't actually really cut any sort of soul as such. Okay, if you think about it, if, if the soul actually existed and you cut this corpus callosum, then actually the soul itself, which should still transfer to both hemispheres, which should have information on both hemispheres, should act still as the link between the here. Okay, now people start to nod, that's good. Okay. So, um, yeah, if, if you can kind of see where I'm going with this, if you cut a physical part of the body, and you still haven't got one, um, if you like, personality that's actually, or, or, or the, the information from those two sides actually um, being able to be transferred across, then there can't be something of a soul involved in the way. Okay. So I said, well, well, one possibility is that actually, right, it's obviously just some stuff. Another possibility, um, well, a much weaker one, I think, is that you cut the soul, and for some bizarre reason, the soul now inhibits. I'm sorry, the head that's one side of the brain, let's say the left side, it's the one that's you know, been reported information back, even though the other side can't. Um, okay, well, okay, so it's a possibility. But the problem with that, of course, is that if you're... 
if, if you've got one side of the brain that needs soul, if you like, to, to, to work, what's happening to the other side of the soul? Because the other side, the, sorry, the other side of the, other side of the, of the brain, if you like. If you're saying it doesn't have, already have a soul in it, then in actual fact, why is it that it can actually still do other types of um, reporting back? Um, the first argument is that, you know, the, the, it can, if you, sorry, I don't think I'm going to tell you before either, um, for those that they haven't seen this like, study. So what can happen is that you actually present information to the uh, left visual hemisphere, the actual, um, the, the, the right brain, if you like, can still actually act on the information in an intelligent way. So for instance, one of the, uh, the tricks that, that you can do is actually get it to draw what it sort of saw on, on, the, on the screen in front of you. So for instance, if you place it up circle, you'd be able to, you know, the, the, the left hand that's being uh, operated by the, the right side of the brain can actually draw a circle as well. Um, in fact, there are actually some sides of, of some functions that the left hemisphere does better than, than the, sorry, right hemisphere does better than the left hemisphere, if you want, if the right's been uh, mixed up here. So, um, for instance, a lot of visuospatial things, like very puzzles, that sort of stuff, actually tends to be better in the, the right hemisphere than in the left hemisphere. And so, um, sometimes with these script playing subjects, you can actually have some really interesting effects happening, for instance, like, um, while the, uh, the right hand is supposed to be doing a puzzle that the left brain is controlling, of course, and it's not doing a very good job on it, the right, uh, sorry, the, the left hand now, which, um, you know, said, um, it's probably a little bit better at doing these things, let's actually try and help the uh, right hand out and actually try and sort of complete the puzzle for it, or we'll break the stakes or something like that. But this all acts in a pretty intelligent way. So again, if you've got a situation where you're saying that the soul, as it were, is now actually happening just the left side, then uh, how do you explain the fact that the, the right hemisphere can still actually do a lot of uh, really interesting and um, intelligent things? Um, so where am I now? So that's the uh, first um, I don't know if I think that the other possibilities. So, uh, got right top. Oh, yes. Um, there is the possibility that, mm, for some bizarre reason, now you've actually got uh, two souls um, because uh, effectively you've chopped the full explosion in half and you've actually divided the soul in half, too. Okay? So, you, you, that sort of solves that problem without one side of the, the head. Um, Having a soul the other one not, and the, you know, the, 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 the um, side of that soul not needing one in a sense. Okay? But of course, you can imagine that that's kind of a problem from the perspective of how most people perceive souls, in the sense that if you can literally chop something in half at the, the, at the level of the, the, uh, the brain and the body, if you like, then, well, effectively, you're um, just uh, dissected the soul as well. That sort of uh, doesn't really affect a lot of people. Certainly from the idea of like a mortal soul, if you want. You can uh, dissect it in two, or why can't you dissect it in three, four, five, six? Hmm, okay. The fourth and final one, which I think is probably the most ridiculous of all, is the idea that um, actually if you, you know, divide this in half, and you can still have two souls, uh, you know, sorry, let's say, say that the original soul, if you want to call it that, now it had it's just to say the left hemisphere, probably the right one, it's not going to make any difference. And, um, People might sort of say, well, you can still actually have a soul in the other hemisphere because some other soul from around about, I don't know, some ghostly thing now comes and possesses that, that side as well. I think they're called thetans. Thetans, okay, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Understandable. Um, and I'll pass you over to Mr. Simon Pollock just here and tell us more about that. Um, yeah, so that, again, um, I know I've ran a little bit here. I'm sorry I don't have this very well uh, coordinated. I sort of got a slight uh, PowerPoint presentation to this thing, but. Uh, <laughs> I can't sort of present it, so, yeah. Anyone got any questions or? Yeah, come in. I know there's an idea um, from people that do argue there's a soul, that the soul is in an ethereal plane, yeah. and the brain is just like an antenna that's picking up signals from the soul. Would that sure. be a possible solution, that maybe two aspects of the soul from the so, so, other okay, dimension so, so, are being so, picked up by the different Okay, aspects? so it's just picking stuff up. How does it have any control over your body then? Is, this, is there any, any is, are, you, are you saying that all it is is just an emergent property of the brain, if you like, that has no control over what the brain and the body does? I mean, I, I myself think that yeah. it's ridiculous. No, uh, but, uh, no, 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 no,
Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is, I said before, um, I think this is a really powerful tool that we can, as a skeptic, can use to actually talk to people about, you know, make them sort of challenge their views on, you know, A, what is a soul, and C, does a soul actually exist? And I think you'll find, actually, if you really think this through hard, perhaps go on the web and look at what these experiments studies do in that, you'll probably come to the conclusion like I had, that actually it really can all but eliminate the idea that a soul, you know, exists in any way that we normally think about it anyway. But the soul, if the soul scene is incorporeal, yeah. what matter is it whether the brain split in half or, or split by an axe in 64,000 pieces? Uh, yeah, I, I would say, well, um, okay, so if it's incorporeal, so, uh, what, what, uh, does, does that explain, or does that not be explained by what I was saying before about the problem that if you cut the brain in half, um, if the brain is still getting information from both hemispheres, then surely it should be able to act as though it were one still, still one whole, not, not as though they're two separate personalities that often actually um, can have different um, reactions to the same sort of stimuli. So you're equating the soul with the personality and saying that if the personality splits, therefore the soul must split? Ah, I think you're going to yeah. Um, I, I think what I'm sort of getting at there is actually if a soul does exist, then it's going to be very different to what most people think of as a soul. I think they'll just about, you know, agree with me that most people think of the soul as being consciousness, really, or something related strongly to it. And that's in the liver anyway, the Greeks Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you're going, so I, I, I've been to the same niche, don't worry about that. <laughs> when you're talking to someone who believes in the soul, you're mistaking them for someone who has rational thought. So, oh, quite right. So why would they need to have any thought processes to this at all? Uh, so else. Well, I mean, what, what I'm saying is that if you at your next party that you go to, um, someone says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a spiritualist, I, I um, believe in soul, etc., etc., et um, you can say, well, okay, do you really? Um, and, and what do you think about a soul? Have you heard about these split brain studies? These split brains really show that, and then use that as a tool, but you sort of really make them challenge their belief systems about that. Uh, 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 sorry, this is trivial, but uh, sort of, I keep thinking of amputations. Where you get a phantom limb. So can yeah. you have a phantom soul? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're phantoms, aren't they? Actually, there is actually one other uh, argument that I've seen actually online um, that, that actually uh, goes well somewhere along the list that someone tried to, to actually sort of counter it by sort of saying, well, um, if you think of uh, the, the right brain space here as being a little bit faulty, it's being like a faulty version of how the, the soul, oh, sorry, perhaps the soul can inhabit the, or rather uh, control, get information from it, etc. The left hemisphere fine, but then with, by cutting the force closing, your ability to actually um, send and get information from the right hemisphere is just compromised. It's not totally gone, it's compromised. So that's, um, you know, you, you still, there's still some sort of link between the two. Um, I, again, I don't think that really uh, washes for much the same reason I said it before, which was that, um, well, even if there's a connection between the two of them, then they should still operate as one sort of whole unit, if you like. Does that make sense? Yeah. People have different reactions to different things. Like, I Think that actually invalidates what I'm, I'm sort of saying there, anyway, of course. Um, 
Actually, the Brexit the Brexit the actually um, said so not only sometimes will they they do things where the uh, the people might even disagree on something or other, but you might even sit here some sort of rather odd things where the uh, one brain which is trying to rationalise and sense what the, the other brain is doing to sort of uh, keep the personal feelings out of it, a um, a uh, you know a, a one sense of identity if you like. Um, how about that? Right. Okay. Uh, there's actually one favourite analogy I've got. We um, with some of these studies, say for instance, uh, the famous one that I've heard of is actually the, the sort of one where the word "coke," you know, C-O-K-E, is presented up on the screen to the uh, right brain, and uh, sorry, the, the left visual field and the right brain sort of seeing that. Um, it was then asked, you know, I guess what did you see? And you know, because the, the species is seems to be most on the left side of the brain, the, the right brain has gone ahead and sort of gone blah, 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 blah. I can't really, you know, explain it. Um, and the way it tried to actually explain it was by actually just suddenly getting up all of a sudden, walking out the door, coming back a few minutes later with a bottle of poke in its hand. And so, this is pretty obvious what's going on there. The person then was asked, you know, um, okay, so why did you bring that back to us? And the person, when you think about it, the left side of the brain saying, to say, well, I was obviously, I was thirsty. So the, the, the left brain in a sense, which was trouble and speech sense, was rationalising the person's actions based around what was happening without really having this information that, hey, actually, in fact, they were primed to go out and get a piece of coke, you know, oh, sorry, a piece of a bottle of coke and then come back again. Yeah. And that's an uh, that's not really one of my favourite analogies, isn't it? Anything else? I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Say, you say you talk about the soul, yes. but have religious people ever bothered to consider what the heck they mean by the soul? Usually not, in my opinion, because it's <laughs> <laughs> so that, that sort of that talk that's saying right. Is quite right Next up we have Don Kennel. Kennel. Pronounced the right the first time when I was speaking. Is he still in the house? I'm assuming not. Nope. Okay, so, uh, skip the camps. I think people get the idea of how this works now. Um, would anybody else like to have a talk? Would anybody else like to have a talk? <laughs> you want to finish off, I've got two questions. Just two questions to finish off to make people think, maybe. How many people here know their star sign? Put your hands up. Pretty much 100%. How many of you know your blood type and rhesus factor? Okay. Fewer. Which do you think is more important? <laughs> <laughs> Try that next time somebody asks you if you're a kid. Being too trying to check up. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, if they ask what your star sign is, you say you're an asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> this is this so we know what blood type diet we need to go on? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's just next time you wheel them to A&E. It doesn't matter if you're a Sagittarius or a Gemini. <laughs> This is more cool. This is um, more of a question type thing and a bit of a rant about um, <laughs> student people. I have a friend, let's call him Idiot Jeff, not his real name. Um, and we've recently had a few debates. Let's call him a conspiracy theorist. Um, our most recent debate was about MSG and how he thinks it makes him sick and trying to explain to him that he can eat tomatoes, cheese and mushrooms and he's fine, so he doesn't. And how it actually can be a good thing because it can lower self content in food and I have a chemistry background, so it was. But trying to get this across to people who are absolutely convinced in whatever conspiracy all about big pharma. Oh, anything's acupuncture cured his arthritis. 
show. Um, so lots of things like that. So I'm really interested to hear about maybe other people's stories. Would yeah, how have, how have you dealt with them? Success stories, radio stories, chance to have a range about stupid people? Yeah, Can I so, have a little rant? Yeah, have a rant. No, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> um, celiac has become a shorthand for fussy. Oh, celiac, the gluten free. It's like you have celiac. No, then how do you know you're allergic to gluten? Oh, but it's better for me. No, exactly. you need fibre. Exactly. It's not. Sorry, that's one of my pet peeves as well. <laughs> year of doing a midwifery degree, um, we studied a whole lot of alternative medicines oh. and, and the, the tutor who was taking us to this particular class was also the person who took us for research, strangely enough, but at one point when she was talking about homeopathy, um, she explained to us that, listen, look, if you do happen to have a woman who's in labour and, and let's just say vomiting and she doesn't have this particular um, thing, homeopathic medicine that she really no, needs, you can just write it down on a piece of paper and hold it in your hand and that will be good enough. <laughs> this is at a university course in my third year of study. Are you still practising? No. Oh, bummer, because I have a friend who needs a midwife who's not my little... Ah. <laughs> and they're hard to find. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I know a hell of a lot of really, really if you wonderful know one midwives. Not alone, can you lots of non-loony yeah. midwives. I know a lot. Can you? Yeah. I'm so, going so to Dancing under the... Yeah. yeah. Where, where, uh, was oh, oh. <laughs> where, when was that? Um, this was Massey University in um, 2010. Yeah, we like some time back when we first had the um, Skeptics Conference of, uh, at Victoria. Uh, I was about seven months pregnant, wandering around Victoria University trying to find where the venue was. Yeah. And I bumped into a room full of women, and they looked at me, and I looked at them, and I thought, this does not look like the Skeptics. And uh, I said, okay, what group's this? And they said, um, oh, we're the midwives, who are you looking for? <laughs> and I said, I'm looking for the skeptics, because they think they're gross, most of you there. I said, I'm looking for the skeptic. And they said, oh, we're the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of stood there and I said, well, you were the people who meant that I don't have to have an episiotomy when I have my baby. <laughs> that was a really good application of skeptical thinking, and I thank you for it. Yeah. <laughs> but just that initial reaction, oh, we're the opposite of that. <laughs> it was quite confounding. I always challenge them on the fact that most alternative practitioners of alternative medicine very quickly abandon it when they get seriously unwell. Unfortunately, the tragedies are when they don't abandon it, of course. But, you know, I put it to one colleague once that, you know, who's into chiropractic, I said, you know, Palmer, the founder of chiropractic, said he could, he could cure any known disease simply by manipulating your backbone. Anything. Um, it would surely make him immortal, but apparently he died. But um, the challenge them on that. You know, why do they abandon it quickly when they get seriously unwell? Why do they, you know, etc, etc? I find with conspiracy theorists, this is a bit of advice, that, that real abuse doesn't work. Mm. No. If you try and argue. Well, they'll take your blob each way. They'll, they'll carry the homeopathy, but they will take their insulin as well, just to be on the safe side. I'll It's a blob each way in my book. That's true. If you're coming on Sunday, I've got a lot of anecdotes for you. Yeah. And, and possible phrases. Sound bites. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, going back to the point about um, sort of changing someone's ideas and stuff, I don't think there's a lot you can do just in one sitting. But what you can do is just to like sort of sow the seeds by sort of just getting them to think a bit more about what they're saying. Just, just ask them to explain their point of view. Um, and just come up with a few little points yourself. And just leave it at that initially. If they're afraid of you, you probably want to talk to them over and over, you know, over a period of time. I think it's the only way to really change it. Yeah, I think um, with that, just letting people know that you're available, letting your non-skeptical friends. So, for example, I had a friend a couple of weeks ago posted on Facebook um, pictures of very large humans, giants that were maybe kind of 20, 30 feet tall, and it was these archaeological pictures. And she's a young Earth creationist Christian. She's like, Mark, what do you think of these? You know, is, is this true? Does this prove the Bible? Because the Bible talks about very large people. 
and it took me two minutes with Snopes to say no. It was a competition to do some photoshopping of archaeological fakery. Um, but just, you know, I, I, I have argued with her at times, but I've not gone so hard that I've scared her away to know that she could come back to me and ask what I really nice to hear. Hi, I've got a colleague who doesn't use microwaves. She thinks microwaves do terrible things to the food and poison you and, and so on. And her evidence, she told me her evidence, she's an intelligent woman. Her evidence was that her sister had a parrot and they gave the parrot some potato that had been baked in the, in the microwave and the parrot wouldn't eat it. And that was her evidence. <laughs> that proved that microwaves are dangerous. I can think of about a thousand other reasons why the parrot didn't eat that potato, but anyway. But she worried about the radiation. Tell her that she's got infrared radiation in her, in her actual conventional oven, so she just mm. just eat more oh. food. I told her she's going to more bananas. I told her she's being bombarded by uh, microwaves and sun all the time she goes outside. From the point of view of infrared radiation, she's emitting it herself all the time as well. Yeah. I get rid of the husband. <laughs> Are you offering very specific services? <laughs> With regards to getting rid of husbands. <laughs> <laughs> Though we do have um, Jay Mann, is one of our long-term members, has written a book called on How to Poison Your Spouse the Natural Way. <laughs> very educational. Let's take one. Has anyone found problems with the term skeptic? Because I talked to a friend of mine, Rachel, um, about a conference, and she's got, I think, a master's degree in ecology and science. She's pro science, hey, you've got the woman science, she's pro woman in science, great. I said, skeptics, oh, skeptic, people who don't believe anything. You're down in comments. Which um, is not true, but um, if anyone else found that the term skeptic is quite misunderstood, we all know, except we mean to imply rational thinking and logical processes and a scientific method, that it's kind of hard to get across the clue. Oh no, idiot Jeff thinks he's a skeptic because he doesn't believe anything. Right, so, so I think maybe the term skeptic Especially is poorly the defined with what yeah. doing. I just heard an audience briefly chatting as well um, with one of the Mets um, who said that he had been talking to somebody about coming here and they assumed skeptics meant conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. following right. on from climate change skeptics. Some skeptics about what the government said. So that was a, that was a totally yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they believe in all these conspiracies and right. anti-governmental kind of things. Right. So that was a whole new flip on the term yeah. skeptics, which right. most of the other encounter being they don't believe anything or they're all dogmatic um, yeah. authoritarian scientists and such. My understanding is that the term skeptic was spelled with an SK, etc. It was set up to sort of define a problem, SC is the word skeptic, um, because of the, the negative connotations that sort of brought them along. It was sort of like time carrying skeptics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Later, but there were various schisms in the early days of psychoanalytics. 
um, when it was forming. Uh, we had four Kurds from the humanists and rationalists who had a very strong notion about what he was doing. Um, James Randi initially, who um, actually left uh, and was separate from Psycho for a very long time in the direct. So there was a, a whole kind of a history there of how are we going to approach things, how dogmatic are we going to be, how broad are we going to draw the church of skepticism as it were. I mean, you go to the States and the, the assumption there is that you must be um, a uh, strongly atheistic, democratic you know, voting um, liberal as part of being a skeptic. Um, we found it really interesting the um, World Congress that, that we went to in, I don't know, about five or six years ago in Burbank. And, and that was very much the assumption, it was very hard to explain to them that we came from a country which was actually very secular, because they were very much under siege from the religious right there. And so there was a very strong focus on the whole anti religion thing as part of the skeptics. Whereas here, we've tended to kind of operate in our media and, and the, the anti-Christian rationalist humanists operate in theirs. So when I was getting towards about religion, I'm usually just shut down to them, primarily except when people would say they had a piece of true art. And then I think back on to well, you can scientifically test that, which is what our original purpose, um, I guess, our hope was to investigate a person. Investigating belief, at least at that point, was pretty hard. It's seeming like the conversation has run its course.